Well, good morning, everybody. We'll go ahead and get started. I just want to welcome our attendees this morning. We're pretty excited for this session. Uh, both Emily and I have animal science background and experience, and so it's always fun to be able to tap into to that expertise. But we also have um, our guest presenter and speaker this morning, uh, Dr. Joe Armstrong. So Dr. Joe, would you want to just briefly introduce yourself to our group this morning? Absolutely. Uh, thanks for having me, Emily and Angie. I think that uh, this is a great opportunity to share just a, a couple of things. The goal today is really to try to help everyone out there avoid some of the things that uh, I've done in ways I've gotten hurt in the past. Uh, I was in private practice for five years in Southeast Minnesota. I'm a veterinarian. I work at Extension now. I'm a cattle production systems extension educator. And today what we're really focusing on is I'm going to say cattle a lot because cattle is what I know. Um, but a lot of this applies also to uh, sheep and goats and pigs. Uh, and it's all about how we're moving livestock, how we're working with livestock and how to stay safe while we do that. So we're going to really try to get through this presentation pretty quick. I'm going to move fast because I want to get to uh, discussion questions and I want to get to watching some film at the end, uh, which will allow us to kind of break down uh, some of the different things that we're doing with uh, handling cattle and livestock. So today we're going to go over equipment, uh, some of the, the ways I've seen people get hurt, how I've been hurt in the past, and how we can avoid that with uh, equipment, including gates, any way you can pinch an extremity or get smashed. Uh, and then ropes, halters, and then uh, specifically talking about shoots because there's some, some dangers there that we need to know about. We'll talk about bulls, and we'll talk about strong instinct dams. I don't like talking about mean cows. I think they do exist, um, but I think that we need to remind ourselves that there's a lot going on in uh, that mom's life when she has a calf. There's a lot going on in, in her uh, physical space, in her uh hormones that are raging through that body. And, and it's a huge experience. You usually end up with a tired cow. There's a lot of things that we can do to give her the benefit of the doubt, in my opinion. And then we'll talk about handling because handling is going to solve most of our problems that we have uh, with safety related to livestock. Okay. The first thing to note right away is that I really don't care how strong you think you are. That cow is stronger every time. Okay. Uh, and th this isn't only just cows. You know, some of our bigger pigs are incredibly strong. Even some of our sheep and goats, what we're talking about is an animal, especially if they're scared, uh, that doesn't really care that they, if they get hurt or not. Uh, and they, they are flailing and moving and, and they're, they're just stronger than you. So even if you look like this person on the, on the left, or if you are as strong as Emily, you really, it, it doesn't matter how strong you think you are, or how strong you actually are, that animal is stronger. And we just have to be okay with that. Gates are a huge piece of this. I, I think I see most of my injuries related to gates and how they're swung, uh, how they're handled, how uh, cattle especially can keep, send them screaming back at you by either kicking that gate or, or just brushing up against it when we're talking about these bulls that are just massive, right? So uh, there's a proper ways to be around a gate, in my opinion. You know, when we're, we're swinging a gate on something, whether it's pigs, sheep, goats, doesn't matter, cattle especially though, uh, where you stand is important. And to me, I don't like to be behind that gate at all, okay? I don't like to be in that position because if I can stand off to the side and I can swing that gate with just an arm holding onto the gate and from the side, if that gate comes screaming back at me, I can let go and there's no, there's no harm in that and it's not gonna catch me or pin me underneath it or, or catch me on, in the head especially or in the body and bruise up my whole side. So try to stand off to the side if you can when you're worrying, worrying about gates and swinging gates. When we're talking about leverage on these gates, I think a lot of systems are designed this way. And I don't see a lot of people use gates this way until you get into an auction market uh, where you have a lot of unpredictable animals, especially when they're uh, alone a lot of times. And, and so the way the gates are set up a lot of times is that you can swing one gate and you can use the gate that's closer to you to swing the gate that's farther along and closer to the animal. This also provides some leverage so that if that gate does try to come back, uh, it's blocked by the gate that's already there, and all that energy goes to the post rather than that gate coming flying back at you at 100 miles an hour. So keep this in mind when you're swinging gates. There's definitely a lot of different ways to do it, ways to set up so that you can provide yourself just that little extra bit of safety when it comes to gates. Last notes on gates here. You know, we're double latches on gates with lots of pressure are great. We know certain gates get pushed on, banged on more than others. Why not put two mechanisms of closing that gate there? 
I love quick lo close gates, quick latches, you know, whatever you want to call it. Anything that I, if I can pull that gate shut and I don't have to worry about looking down or finding a chain to hook or trying to line that gate up perfectly, I just want to know what's closed behind me and I can pay attention to what's happening uh, around me in the pen. If you do have to be behind a gate, it's really important to keep your arms extended. Uh, I've seen people lose teeth. I've, I've gotten stitches. I've broken my nose. You have to have your hands, uh, your arms extended if you're gonna be behind that gate with your arms slightly bent, but you don't wanna be up against that gate because even with the uh, sheep, goats, or pigs, um, but especially cattle, if that gate comes back and you're not ready for it and you don't have time to respond, you're gonna lose some teeth. Part of that is coming back to overcrowding pens. There's a lot of situations where just bringing a few animals, a smaller number of animals, is gonna save you a lot of headache, uh, both uh, literally and figuratively because we, we don't need to put pressure. We need those animals to have room to move and take direction inside that pen. And if we load it up, all we're doing is pressuring that gate and kind of tempting fate with that kind of thing. Okay, let's get to pinching fingers, hand, arms, legs, hands, everything. You know, we really don't want to put ourselves in a situation where we could get pinched. And most of this happens. I was just talking to a friend of mine, a veterinarian who broke his hand last week uh, because he wasn't quite paying attention to this rule. That cow's head, uh, pig's head too, sheep, goats, they're made to bang on things. That, that's how they're designed. They're made to push on stuff and bang into each other. And it's, it's just basically a giant hammer. And we just want to avoid putting ourselves in a situation where we're just tempting the cow to, to turn whatever body part we have in that position into the nail. So here's one of the most common ways on a dairy that I see hands and fingers pinched. And this is how my friend broke his arm. There's so many different places that you should not be putting your hands uh, in a headlock like this. Anywhere where that cow could pinch you against the pipe is not somewhere you want your hand. And the other thing you need to think about is that this headlock moves. And even if those headlocks are locked and it's in the bars in the upright position, I've seen them fail a lot. And you can't be putting your hand somewhere or your arm somewhere where it's going to get pinched. So these two X's on the right are examples of that. The two X's on the right are, are where if that headlock were to come open like it is now, your hand would be pinched. And those are tempting spots to use uh, when the headlock is closed or it's locked. But if it fails, you're going to be in a world of hurt. So just keep in mind all these different places you can get pinched, fingers, hands, legs, uh, your head obviously being the most important. This applies to the beef side as well. So when we've got an animal in the chute, there's all different sorts of pinch points. You're never ever putting your hand in the top or the bottom without uh, proper restraint. And I would just prefer you don't do that ever. Um, and then to the side, the, that head can move side to side and pinch you up against the chute. That becomes even more important when we're talking about having some of the accessories on the front of that chute that stick out a ways. Uh, they're great spots to get smashed and uh, have your hand caught in a bad spot. The alley is probably the the biggest spot I see people get pinched or, or crushed. And it's because we're trying to vaccinate in the alley because it's quicker. But what we're, what we're trying to do is look at all these different pinch points that you could, you can see here. You know, if we start from left to right, I've got a bar, an upright bar that if cattle move front or back, if my arms on the wrong side of that bar, I could get pinched. I've got uh, a movable butt plate and that's going to move when the cattle pass through it. So you need to be aware of that, especially if they pick their head up at it. It can swing pretty good, so you want to be careful where you're leaning over. There's very small gaps where you can get pinched that your hand should never be. And then again, you know, all these different places, you just need to be aware of if something were to go wrong or the cattle were to move in an unexpected way, am I okay? Am I, am I setting myself up uh, and taking too big of a risk in these situations? And that's something that should be on your mind all the time. Now, ropes, I think, are a huge piece of safety. They're a big tool. But again, like any tool, they can be used incorrectly. Uh, and there are certain situations that they should be used and some that they shouldn't. Uh, the big thing for me with hands, especially if you're not new to cattle or, or if, you're, if you are new to cattle or you haven't been using a rope for too long for a lot of this stuff, is you need to have your hands in the position like these guys up top here. You want to have your thumb out front. I see a lot of times where uh, people end up grabbing the rope in, in a, a different way and the pinky is out front. And that's really, you're, you're putting your weakest finger out front to take all the pressure. And that's not something you want to do. So you should be thinking about it like a tug of war. That's if you, how you would grab the rope in that way. That's how you should have your hands on the rope. 
uh, I you have to think about and in, in use leverage because we, as we discussed about, these animals are stronger than you and they're always going to be. Uh, so you need to be able to think about friction and leverage. And the way we do that most of the time is by wrapping that rope around the post. Usually I wrapped once, then get it tight. And then I take a couple additional wraps to make sure that I have the leverage I need. I don't like tying ropes if I don't have to. If I'm holding a head or a leg or something like that, I'd much rather get an extra wrap and have someone hold that rope because if something goes wrong and I need that pressure off, it's much easier to just tell the person to let go of the rope and all my pressure is gone all of a sudden, rather than tying it. And even when you use a quick release rod, having to fight with that sometimes to get it, get the pressure off. So I tie only when I need to, I use a quick release not to do that. We'll go over how to tie one of those quickly. I use a Honda a lot on all my ropes. Um, it's a quick release mechanism and it's pictured right here. Uh, it's a two piece metal deal that has a saddle and then also a clasp that comes down over the top of that saddle to, to hook it in place. And it allows you to tie uh, a loop very quickly. And the reason I like the, the Honda so much is that it minimizes the time I spend in the danger zone around feet or, or around the animal in general, because I can loop that through, make my quick loop, and that the more important piece is when I'm done. I don't have to fiddle around with trying to untie a knot down there. I just tie a little string to the end of the clasp that comes down. And, uh, and there's usually a hole there just for that. And then you can just pull that, that string, the whole thing comes apart and you can just stay out of the, the danger zone being right next to those cattle, especially when we're working around feet and with beef cattle who aren't necessarily used to people touching them in that way. So let's re watch this video um, of the quick release and we'll go from there. Okay, so here is the quick release video. Hopefully everyone hears it. Hey everybody, this is Dr. Joe Armstrong. We're out in the shop today to talk about quick release knots. We're gonna to pretend today that this is our cow and I've already got my halter on my cow. We just need to tie her head now. To do that, we need to make a quick release knot to be safe for everybody. So we're gonna get our wraps first. So we can get everything tight. Okay, I've got it tight. Now I'm just gonna leave my front hand right where it is. I'm gonna take my back hand. I'm gonna pass it away from me underneath that front hand. That's gonna give me this loop. That loop goes underneath the rope that's attached to the cow. I take my hand and I put it through that loop. I'm gonna reach back across and grab the free end of the rope. And I'm gonna pull it through the loop, okay? Then I just can tighten everything down. She can pull on that all day. It's not gonna go anywhere. But if something does go wrong and I need to get rid of my knot, I just need to grab the free end of my rope and pull and my knot goes away. Okay, so I think what you can see there is that it's, a, we can watch it again at the end if anybody's interested. Um, the, the reason that that we we do that is because we can really um sorry here hold on one second i shouldn't try to talk and do that kind of stuff at the same time um what we're what we're working with there is the ability to get rid of that tension and that knot right away and if something is wrong uh you need to be able to do that otherwise you're going to ruin a lot of rope um as you try to um honestly just get the tension off, you're gonna be cutting a lot of rope to be, to make that happen. So we wanna avoid that at all possible. And that's really what we're doing with, uh, with the quick release knot. So we'll watch that again. If anybody has any questions, we can watch it at the end. All right, so with halters, I personally think that halters uh, are one of the most underrated pieces of safety equipment. I, when I was in practice, I had three, four in my truck at any given time. Uh, and it's a way to control that head and it gives you secondary restraint. There's sometimes when we're in facilities or situations where I don't quite trust uh, the equipment itself or, or the cow is making me nervous about it, just in any situation like that, throw another halter on or throw a halter on and tie your head uh, to something that you know is not going to move. It just gives you that, that peace of mind when you're working with an animal that big. Okay, one note on halters and lead ropes, and this applies to horses, sheep, goats, everything you can put a halter, halter on. We want to coil up that extra slack. That, that's a given. We don't want that trailing around or, or stepping on it or getting caught somewhere. But at the same time, we don't want to make a loop out of that material uh, when we're coiling it up and then putting our hand through that loop. 
Because what happens if this animal gets spooked, especially with horses and, and cattle, uh, they're going to take off and, and pull. And if your hands inside that loop, we're going to, uh, it's going to tighten down pretty quick. And if it tightens down good enough, uh, you're along for the ride, whether you want to be or not. So just a kind of a note, keep your hand out of that loop uh, and uh, it'll, it'll save you from uh, skiing behind a cow. All right. Uh, shoots are safety equipment. For, for everyone, for cattle and for, for you. And it, and it makes everyone safer when we're trying to access, especially head and feet. Uh, but when we're giving treatments, especially with animals that are sick and they're already uh, pretty wound up, uh, we really need to have a shoot. I think anyone who has cattle, they should have a shoot and they should have the facilities to get an animal to the shoot safely. Uh, the squeeze itself is important to me. That allows you to control uh, how much the animal flails around, and it actually calms that that animal down when you can squeeze them down and prevent them from moving. So here's the one thing about shoots that I see broken the most. This is the rule that I see get the most people hurt: putting your head anywhere where that animal can reach you with their head, uh, especially over the top of that head. It, it, if you're gonna headbutt a cow you're going to lose every time uh, and it's 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 going to hurt so the the position that uh this gentleman is is in is perfect he kind of leaned back knowing that 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 head head and neck uh have a longer reach than he he probably uh is, thinks and he's keeping making sure he's keeping his head out of the way that is the proper position and and you really need to watch that because it is tempting when you're trying to read a tag or you're trying to lean you lean a little too close and that's when you uh you lose teeth Okay, I personally do not like scissor shoots, but the, the reason that we're talking about them today is because they are the number one reason you need to observe a shoot uh, functioning before you're working around it. You need to be able to see what opens where, uh, where you can stand safely. Because scissor shoots, I've personally seen people knocked out by a scissor shoot, and I've heard stories of people dying because of scissor shoots and the, and the way they come open. You can see that. Uh, when they come open like that, they stick out quite a ways. Uh, and if you combine that with the hydraulics and an animal pushing on it, uh, that corner of that chute comes down right at head level uh, and right, like, pretty much lines up perfectly with my temple. Uh, so you really need to be able aware of where you can stand around a chute, any chute, but especially scissor chutes uh, and where you can stand safely. Uh, and really the way to do that is to observe, observe it being used uh, before you're working around it so you can see uh, where you need to avoid. Um, I've seen certain working facilities will actually put tape on the floor so that people know they cannot be in those areas. Okay, we'll talk about bulls and, and strong moms. Uh, I think that that's a key piece of this, especially when we're talking about handling and, and the precautions you need to take. So general rules, I'm a big proponent of being cautious but not fearful. Uh, if we're timid or indecisive, that's going to get you hurt. Uh, you're just tempting fate if you're doing those kind of things. So we don't want to be fearful, but we need to have an abundance of caution. We'll always have an out. You need to have a way out of a pen, out of a situation. And you need to plan for that ahead of time uh, because it, it will save you. And we'll talk more about that when we get to story time. So try not to work alone. Uh, I, when I was younger, I, I think I was pretty typical. I had trouble asking for help. Uh, mostly because uh, I saw it as sign of, a sign of weakness or I thought it was kind of shameful to have to ask for help. I'm completely over that. Um, and I think the quicker that everyone can get to that point, the better. You need to be okay asking for help. It, it's just the better way to be. Uh, and I have youth on here uh, additionally because when, when people grow up around cattle and they get really comfortable around certain cattle, uh, I see a lot of kids get, basically they have no caution zero caution at all and that's if you're around cattle long enough that's going to bite you uh you you're tempting it fate every time you go into a situation without having an out and and knowing which and stopping and looking at the situation before you get into it so we can't we can't do that and every time you do it uh you just come one step closer to uh getting hurt so emily's probably talked about this before we need to pause evaluate the situation you know, uh, I especially look at pastures. You don't want to be out in the open field with that bull staring you down and not have anywhere to go. 
uh, that's where you really need to ask for help because uh, they're faster than you, they're stronger than you, all those things. Pens with high walls, all those different situations where you don't have a clear out. You need to identify one or get help so that you know you have at least someone watching your back. When we're talking about bulls, the majority of bull related injuries I personally see are not because a bull's mean or they're trying to trying to actually get you. Uh, they're just big. They're just absolutely massive and they swing gates, they break posts, they break equipment, they fight each other. And they, as soon as they start pushing on each other, they don't care who's around. So it's just about being situation, situationally aware with bulls most of the time. And that comes to the same, same thing with our strong moms. You just have to have an out and be prepared. Take your safety first. If you're in doubt, just either get more help, more equipment, whatever you need, or, you know, especially with our new, our new mom, mom cows, uh, let it go. Just let her calm down for 48 hours. And a lot of times their demeanor will change. Uh, most of this can be solved with proper low stress handling. We're going to get to that. Here's my Harry Potter reference. I promised Emily I'd throw in at least one. Uh, you have to just be constantly vigilant. You cannot trust any bull at any time. I would, I would say you also can't trust any cow 100%. Okay. And if someone tells you that you can trust the bull, you need to just throw that out. That is not a comment that I pay attention to at all. Um, you cannot trust any bull, especially if you don't know the bull at all. Okay, here's story time. Here's the first time um, where I needed an out and I had it. And if I didn't, uh, I wouldn't be here. So here's the situation. We have this working facility. I've got pen three with my animal. I've got two gates between me and that animal. I walk into my, my working pen or my loading pen that then loads into the working alley. That gate gets locked behind you um, and you are then responsible for getting animal from pen three into uh, the loading pen. So the first thing I did when I get when I get into this pen is I go and I make sure that pen one is open. That gate is uh, not latched and I can swing that that gate at any time, but I leave the gate closed. Do the same thing with pen two. So now I've got two outs. If something bad happens, I can bail into pen two which I'm gonna to have to do anyway, because when I open pen three, I wanna get into pen two to work that animal into the loading facility. But I have two outs, pen two and pen one. And in this case, I needed pen one for sure. I needed my second out or I wasn't gonna be here. Because when I open that middle gate, when I open the middle gate, hopefully you can see my pointer. When I open this gate, uh, the bull was standing right at the gate to pen three. And despite it having two latches, he blew that gate apart. Uh, the quick latch completely destroyed, hook and chain, both gone. Uh, and he decided that I he did not like me at all. If I had not had pen one ready to go, I didn't have time to get to pen two. So if pen one hadn't been unlatched and me to get in there, I, I don't think I'd be here today. So you need to be aware that there's two outs. So uh, I got bruised legs out of this deal from him banging it on me while I was up on top of the fence, but uh, I was alive, which is uh, the key piece, right? So have an out, think ahead of time, potentially have two outs if you need it. Uh, it, it. It will save your life at some point. Okay, let's get into handling and then we'll get into some videos. So I think handling is a combination of things. It's uh, a combination of your mindset, um, having the practicing low stress handling and then having the facilities to, to allow you to do those things. We don't have time to get into facility design. That's a Huge lecture, huge topic, Temple Grandin Systems, Bud Williams Stockmanship, the Bud Box being the most uh, famous of his inventions. Uh, we just don't have time to get into that, though there's lots of YouTube videos out there for you to, to check out on that kind of thing. And we'll, we'll get into some other stuff today. Cattle handling, low stress cattle handling is not a rodeo. And if at any time you're working cattle and it feels like a rodeo, something's wrong. Uh, either the people involved are, are doing it incorrectly or your facilities don't allow you to conduct low stress handling. So that, that's, a, that's a key piece. If you ever feel like, man, this is a rodeo, uh, you need to stop and evaluate whether or not we can change something to make it better or whether we should be doing it at all in these facilities uh, because it, it's bad for everyone and it's just gonna get someone hurt and, and add stress to the cattle. It's not healthy for them. Uh, so you need to never feel, have that feeling. When we communicate with livestock, I don't care if it's cattle, sheep, pigs, goats, what we're, the goal is to build trust. We want continued positive interactions and those interactions need to allow us to build trust. Every time we have a positive interaction with these, these livestock, 
that builds our trust with the livestock. Cattle definitely can trust people. And you've seen that if you own cattle, when someone new shows up, uh, they act completely differently because they don't have that built trust with that person. We have to understand that all these animals are prey animals and there are certain re certain actions they take because of that. Uh, I truly believe that having a positive attitude, demeanor is something that wears off on the cattle. They can, they can sense if you're uptight or you're angry or you're stressed. Learn if you don't take the pressure away, they have no reward. Okay. So once they do what you want, you need to take the pressure off that caused them to do that in the first place. I'm a big proponent of no loud voices, no hand flailing. Uh, sticks and paddles are not used to touch animals. Uh, they're only to maintain distance and control. Uh, I carry a paddle or a stick most of the time just to remind me how far away I need to be so I don't get kicked. Uh, so it is a safety mechanism in that manner. And it's just an extension of my arm. I'm not flailing it or, or doing anything with a flag or a stick or a paddle. Um, I'm using it as an extension of my arm to increase my reach, but I'm still doing that in a calm manner and a very precise, calm way. Uh, prods, Again, a tool that I see used incorrectly a lot. It is a tool though, uh, and it can be used correctly and incorrectly. The big thing is that if you find yourself reaching for it constantly, again, uh, we're getting close to rodeo status. And that means that we need to look at, okay, what's wrong with my facility or the, what I'm doing that's causing me to have to use the prod. So uh, keep that in mind. The flight zone. I think we all have seen this diagram at one point or the other when we go through BQA or anything else. I think it's slightly out of date. Um, the flight zone differs for each animal. Some, you know, especially with like a dairy cow, you got to get much closer to them before they're reacting. It differs from cattle to ca cow to cow. You know, some cows are a quarter mile away and they're already moving from you. And some cows you got to be almost touching before they're actually moving. For me, the point of balance is the eyes, not the shoulder. And I think that's supported by some of the people that are, are really championing low stress, championing low stress handling, uh, people like Tom Knopfsinger. So the eyes are, are where I try to focus. Here's the, the basic rules for how cattle and all livestock want to move. They want to see what's pressuring them. Um, and that means that they're going to want to see you while they move and while you pressure them. So if you try to chase from the back, they're going to turn around and look at you, the, the animals in the front for sure. It's because they want to see you and they want to see what's pressuring them. That goes along with wanting to circle back. You know, these cattle want to circle back and they want to circle anything that makes them uneasy. And in this case, when you're trying to move them, that's you. And they also want to maintain contact with the herd. They do not want to be alone. And I can help you in certain situations. If you have a really riled up cow and you're trying to work her on her own, all you need to do most of the time is go get her a friend and she'll calm down. But it also means that we shouldn't be chasing animals from the back. We should be moving the front of the herd and then the back will follow. Okay. Cattle and all livestock are not super brilliant. I'll admit that, but they do take direction very, very, very well. And we need to be clear and precise in that direction that we're giving them. Uh, again, I think we've covered this pressure when cattle have nowhere to go is, is one of my biggest pet peeves. Why am I asking this cow to move if she has nowhere to go? Uh, and that, that needs to happen. Then we're, we're not building trust anymore because that cow has no idea what you want and has no idea, no way to respond to that pressure besides getting uh, riled up and amped up. So we need to apply pressure uh, and then take it away. So here's the situation. Uh, I want to empty this pen. I want these cattle to move south, okay? I want them to go down this alley and go wherever I need them to go. So the way I think about where I need to stand in this pen and how I need to move is I try to map out in my mind, where do I want the cattle to go? When I get to the gate, the cattle are probably gonna push down to the, the bottom right corner. And then what do I do? Well, I want them to move like this, right? And what you can see is I've created a circle, okay? I'm, I'm almost to a, a full circle. These cattle want to move in a circle, like I said, remember? But if you chase from the back, it's not going to work, okay? Or it, it, it could work, but it's not gonna work very well. And it's just gonna cause the cattle uh, anxiety because they can't see you. They're gonna wanna circle inside the pen to, to see where you are. Uh, and that's not ideal. You can also be at the top of this, right? But again, you're, you're outside the circle. They wanna see where you are. They're gonna wanna try to go into the gate up top, even though it's still there and they know it's closed. And they're gonna probably circle in the far, upper left corner here rather than push south. So we don't wanna be there. Um, the other piece about this is that I see this a lot. It will empty this pen, um, but because the cattle wanna get uh, away from you a little bit, they're gonna hit this post a lot uh, and that's, that's not ideal. This is where you wanna be in this pen. 
you're inside the circle. They want to circle you. They want to come half around you and they're going to flow out of this pen. You, in most cases, you don't have to do anything except step into this pen and stand right in this position. If you need to move the cattle any more than that or apply pressure, I would suggest you take one, two steps at the most in the direction of the cattle and they'll flow and get out of that pen on their own. So here's one of the concepts that I see all the time when we're talking about cattle handling and it's, it's counterintuitive. So I always like to bring it up. If cattle are traveling from right to left in this diagram and I walk to the left, the cattle are not, I, are not gonna move faster. They're actually gonna slow down. So I think that's kind of counterintuitive and that's why chasing cattle doesn't usually work super well. Um, and if I, and, and the opposite of that is if I move against the flow of the cattle, they're actually gonna speed up. And that becomes really important when we're talking about working at the chute. Okay, if I need to get an animal into the chute and I've got cattle in the alley here, if I stand at the back, I'm giving clear direction to the cow right in front of me that I want them to move. But now we're in a situation where we're giving pressure, but that cow has nowhere to go. Okay, nothing can move until that front cow needs to move. And if I stand in the back, that front cow has, has no idea what you want. They're, she's getting no direction and they want direction. Okay. The back cow is getting direction, has nowhere to go. The front cow doesn't know what you want because you're so far back. Okay. That's not the correct way to do things. What we need to do is stand at the front. And when we want that cow to move, we make sure we get eye contact from that cow. So she's paying attention to us. And then we push against the grain, against the grain. And what that allows us to do, if we step against the flow, like I said, that'll cause the cattle to move and speed up. Once we get movement and what we want, we need to take the pressure off. So instead of walking back along the chute and keeping the pressure on, we need to take a big circle back to our reset point. And this is the circle you walk all day. You will probably not touch 95% of the cattle to make this work. So it's very simple, but it, it is a little counterintuitive. Okay, let's watch some film because I'm sure you're tired of me talking at you. Okay, let's get to the film. Um, and while Joe is doing that, I'm right. just gonna interject really quickly. I put in the chat um, a tip that I use to remember that because like Joe said, it's really counterintuitive. I just tell myself head to tail never fails. So when That's you're perfect. trying to move the cattle and walk against them, head to tail is the way you wanna move along the animal. How are we doing on time, Em? Uh, you probably have about, oh, 10, 15 minutes, and then uh, we want to have time for Q&A and such. You bet. Okay, so what we're going to do uh, on this is, if anyone's played sports, we're going to watch this like film. Okay, I'm going to let you watch it one time through. I'm not going to say a word. And then what we're going to do is... Um, what we're gonna do is kind of break it down and show you uh, the things that I see when I watch this film. So, Em, can you see that? Yes, I can see it. Okay, perfect, thank you. Um, so let's watch it one time through. All we need to do is get these cattle to walk out this door on the left uh, from this pen and we'll watch it one time through and then we'll break it down. Okay, so let's break it down and I'll tell you what I see. So the big thing is that we're trying to get these cattle to go out this, this door over here. And uh, I think the good thing that we can say about this, this, uh, this position here is that 
what we what we have is a really calm setup and these people are doing an excellent job uh and being pretty calm about everything uh the sound was on so i didn't hear anything but cattle coughing didn't hear any yelling or whistling or any loud noises that would disturb the cattle so i think it's really important uh to notice that right away so let's get into to what i think could be improved about this situation so um these cattle clearly trust these people. Um, they're not super riled up. Um, well, so I think what you'll notice right here, um, as we're walking this line over here on the left, you already have cattle in the middle here on the post that you can see are trying to circle those people. And I think that's important to note. That's the, that, that attitude that they have already. Now, what you'll notice is that my man up here in the gray sweatshirt towards the front, towards the door, it is going to create the movement and he does a good job of doing that so watch him step forward and watch his cattle move out that door all he did was take one step and they started to go now what i would prefer at that point once he got that movement i want him to step back and take the pressure off because the cattle are already doing what we want they're already flowing out that gate uh, there's no reason to have any pressure on those animals anymore now here we're going to get to some, some other improvements here uh, as these cattle are pushed up against this wall um, they know where to go. They want to stay with everybody. They can't really get out that door any more than they already are. Okay. They're, they're moving about as fast as they can. So again, I would like um, all the way on the left here, this person to step back, take the pressure off. They're already doing what we want. I would prefer that my other two people here actually stop at the center post. There's no reason to continue to add pressure when these cattle are already doing what we want. And you'll see the result of that is that we get one that, that wants to come out of the group. Um, again, we have some hand uh, waving and a little too much of that i think on the right which i know i'm being pretty nitpicky but we get this animal coming out because there's pressure with nowhere to go um, there's no reason to add pressure they're already doing what we want you also notice that off the left here we have some cattle that are trying to come back down this alley and that's because they want to see they want that pressure from uh to circle the pressure from the front really most of the pressure for this group and how to get this cat these cattle to empty out of this group is we, we want that person in front to be creating the movement and putting pressure and taking it off when we get when we have movement stop or slow down. Uh, and our my back two people really are just acting like a giant gate halfway down the pen to keep the cattle where they're supposed to be and kind of focused. But we don't need to be applying pressure when the cattle are already doing what we want. And that's where we get, like I said, that cow that or that steer that wanted to break out uh, and Fortunately, that animal is very nice and that clearly has some trust because it wants to play and frolic and that's good. But I think there's improvements here uh, to go from there. We're going to watch one more and then we'll get to questions. First, Joe, I want to interject with a quick question. Um, mm -hmm. So I was actually with Joe on this farm when we were giving this video. And I'm just wondering, you know, the thing that I noticed and you kind of hinted at it, but could you speak to it a little bit more? And that is that each of these people that are in this pen very clearly have their own job and are doing their own job. Like when that one uh, kind of starts running around and getting wild, you know, nobody else goes after it. There's just the one person who's kind of working on that. So just kind of want to speak to that, you know, delegation of tasks. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this, this operation specifically is an absolute well-oiled machine and we'll, you'll be able to see, um, the rest of the this barn in the next video uh, but what you're seeing is that uh, they do this every day they bed cattle every day and they do it with the cattle outside the pen and i think that's important for a lot of different health reasons but it also gives these cattle exercise it allows them to walk the pens at the same time pull uh, sick animals make my poles all sorts of different things there's a fence all the way around this you'll see that in the next video um, but yeah, they have delegated tasks and everyone is very calm. And I think that's very, very good. But we're still having a tendency to chase cattle. Uh, and I, I would prefer that we're moving cattle from the front uh, and we're using our extra people as just a big gate, basically, without really providing pressure. Okay, let's get to the next one. Okay, so this is an overhead view from a drone uh, from up top, and uh, we're putting these cattle back in. Uh, and so there's two pens in this barn. It's split right down the middle. This is actually the, the cattle from the, the barn or the pen on the right. Uh, 
what we're looking at here is we want these cattle to go in this door on the bottom left where they're kind of hanging out. Clearly there's some routine. Some of these cattle already know what's going to happen and they're waiting for that gate to open. The, the tendency though, is that when we get a big group like this, we we're trying to chase the animals in the back and it works just like we were talking about with the shoot. They, they don't know what you want. Uh, they don't really know where to go because they don't have much of a place to go. Uh, but the cattle in front, if you were to move them, everyone else would follow. So there's good and bad in this. And I don't think we'll watch this through all the way uh, without me commentating. But so what we see is I think the good thing right here is that this person up here by the tractor took a big step back, realized that there was just too much pressure on those animals. They didn't have anywhere to go. And that that's the correct move. Take a step back, give them more room, keep them from getting anxious because they have nowhere to go yet. And the front doesn't have any direction. So what you see on the bottom here is that the gate opens and cattle start to flow, okay? They start to come in, but they don't have clear direction from anybody. And you can see right here, we've got a bubble on the top corner of this little out, uh, this little overhang on the, on the left. And that bubble is because someone is working, is trying to get to the front to move the front. Uh, and that's, that's the correct move. If I was gonna work these cattle and try to get these cattle in, I again would put people in the back that just act as a big gate, not providing pressure. And I would put someone down here on the lower left of this overhang, and they would be moving back and forth to move the cattle uh, through the choke point and into the barn. And you'll see that's what happens. So I want you to watch and see what happens when we get movement in the front. We got someone uh, next to that overhang and they're, they're walking down and actually they walked to the, to the front and then moved backwards and walked against the cattle. You can see the bubble again. And all those cattle flow. You know, you move the front, the rest of the herd want, or the rest of the cattle want to be with everybody else. There's no reason to pressure them immensely. And as they flow in, it's a very easy process just by moving the front of the herd and not adding extra pressure in the back when those cattle really don't know where they're supposed to be going. So overall, amazing job on these, this group. Um, and with that, I think we'll, we'll quit and get to questions. All right, thank you so much, Joe. Uh, so for our participants, uh, you have kind of two options. You can put a question in the chat and you and I will be keeping an eye on that. Uh, we also do have the Q&A box. So if you wanna click on that, um, you can put your question there, especially if you wanna ask something anonymously, uh, you can do that via the Q&A. So one, you know, kind of, overarching thought that I want to share. And when I, you know, I'm talking with Joe about livestock safety and when we're discussing that kind of stuff, you know, I always say there are two major goals in livestock safety, and that is to keep us safe from the animals, but also to keep, you know, the animals safe from us. And I think Joe demonstrated that really well uh, in just showing that sometimes you know, we are giving the wrong signals. It's not that the cows are doing something wrong. Uh, we are the ones that are doing something wrong. Um, and, you know, I also think of, of animal handling kind of like a dance. Uh, you know, you're responding to each other's movements and kind of figuring out how to move in sync um, and still opposite of one another. So Joe, could you talk a little bit about, um, you know, you brought up that you don't like to, to, to use the term, you know, crazy mothers. And, and I think that's really, that's an appropriate way to, to talk about it, right? Because, you know, explain what the cow is going through and, and why we need to, as, as the owner or handler, we need to respect that a little bit and, um, you know, understand some of those behaviors. Yeah, I think uh, the thing that hits me hardest is when I listen to people like Tom Ossinger and uh, Kip Lukasiewicz. Uh, they're people that are really championing the fact that we need to change our relationship with cattle a little bit and, and how we go about low stress handling. And that includes how we handle uh, the calf at birth. Uh, it, it's a whole process. And just like a lot of things with cattle, uh, uh, you're playing a, a game year round uh, to have calving go very, very, very well. Um, and things you do long before uh, calving season affect how your interaction with those cattle. So building the trust year round, uh, letting the cattle know 
that you have their best interests at heart and you really are saying, okay, if you, if you respond to the pressure, then I'll take it away. And that's no different than when you, you're, you're working on a horse and getting them to neck rein or anything like that. You give them pressure, and when they do what you want, you take it away. Uh, so we need to keep that in mind. I think cows are taught to be, uh, you know, there's obviously cows that are more, uh, have a stronger mothering instinct than others, and they, they can get a little um, uh, high-spirited or whatever you want to call it around calving. But it's because they have uh, uh, just an absolute massive amount of hormones in their system. And, and often if you get to a point where you really aren't able to get to that calf, I would rather you be safe and come back in 48 hours. And I think you'd be very surprised at how much that cow's demeanor has changed. Uh, also, um, I, I think that's a part of trust. You know, if you've been around those cattle enough and you go to, uh, gently and calmly take that calf, uh, away from that mom, just for a second, make sure she can see it. I really don't like, I mean, you should never turn your back on the mom anyway, but make sure you're, you pick up that calf very gently. Um, the worst thing is to get some sound out of that calf. That's what really gets mom fired up. Right. Uh, but if you pick that calf up very gently and have her see it as you walk backwards to wherever you need to be, uh, and then handle the calf in a way that they aren't, uh, uh distressed. And to me, a lot of times they make a lot of things where you're looking at a sling system where that calf is hanging. It's amazing how calm they are in those slings. Um, but I, I really truly believe that if you have a mom that, that is struggling with that interaction and is really uh, not allowing you to do that, you can try again and make sure that you are spending more time with that animal prior to calving to, to give her a chance. Um, and if it's not working, then yeah, she should go. You don't need her around. Uh, it's not worth having that danger there. So we do have a question in the Q&A box, but before we get to that, I want to ask a follow-up question on that, Joe, and that is, you know, I don't know if there's any research on this or if you just have kind of, you know, anecdotes or your personal opinion on uh, talking to livestock as you're working with them. I mean, I know no yelling, screaming, et cetera, uh, but just, you know, I've been told, yeah, using kind of soft conversational tones, um, especially if you are maybe dealing with, with a mom and a baby, uh, for whatever reason, that auditory piece uh, can sometimes help alleviate some of the stress on the animal as too. Do you have any, you know, insight on that or am I just full of crap? No, no. Um, the thing about it is it, there's two thoughts on the process, right? I, I personally prefer that everything uh, is silent, but I do find myself talking to the animals. Now it has to be something that they're used to as well. If you always talk to the animals and then all of a sudden you're silent, they're going to notice that something's different. So if you're always talking to them and it's calm, I also, I also think that it also helps the person, uh, maybe more than it helps the cow. Uh, it reminds you to stay calm. It tells you, you know, all it keeps you in the right mindset, all these other things. So, uh, whatever works for you, it should be quiet and consistent. That should be the big thing. Um, but that's, that's the big piece of that. If you're going to do it, it should be consistent, uh, and, and realize that it might be more for you than it is for her. Yeah. I love that. I think that that's a really great point because, you know, we hear again and again about any animal, uh, you know, livestock dogs, et cetera. Like if you are nervous, they can sense it. Absolutely. So yeah, if, if calming yourself down by talking to the animals slash yourself helps go for it. Um, but we did get a question in the Q and a box. Uh, this person said, I do not have livestock, but have potential of being on livestock farms in the future. What is the biggest risk to watch out for? Um, if you don't have livestock now, uh, I guess the biggest risk in my opinion is, uh, improper facilities, having facilities that are not meant to handle the animals you're trying to work with. Uh, I see a lot of things that are slapped together, uh, which can work. I mean, it doesn't have to be super expensive, but you need to understand animal flow uh, and you need to be calm around that. Uh, I think it depends on what kind of livestock you're going to get into. Um, but having uh, bulls around is a big, it, it just adds a, a lot of risk. And if you don't have to have a bull around to make it work for your operation, that might be something to look at. Overall though, I think it's about having proper facilities and the confidence in those facilities to make animal flow go correctly. I think that's the biggest risk in my opinion is when we, we start to try to use facilities that are not made correctly and the flow is not set up correctly. And that's where you get people 
frustrated. Uh, cattle have no clear direction. They get riled up and all of a sudden you've got a, a circle, just a, a vicious cycle of everyone getting fired up. Uh, and that's, that's probably the biggest risk for any of the, the species. And Joel, like you had mentioned before, you know, I think animal behavior in itself is something, you know, for that individual that asked that question is understanding how animals behave, you know, so most of the species that we work with are gregarious, right? They want to be in that herd. And, um, and so watching, trying to pull one is, is going to be challenge, move one from a group is going to be challenging. And, and so under just understanding some of those behavior pieces, I think is, is going to be really crucial um, to, to go back to that, answering that question. Yeah. And I, I think that the, the big thing for me is always um, constantly reevaluating what you're doing. If it's not going well and you feel yourself getting to rodeo stage, you need to stop. Everyone needs to stop and take five minutes first to calm down, but also to reevaluate. It, it's sometimes it's incredible how simple the solution is. Uh, it's either getting another animal when you have a single and all of a sudden everything is so much easier, or it's bringing the cattle from a different direction so that you take advantage of how they want to move anyway instead of fighting it. Uh, even super, super, super simple, simple fixes like that can, uh, can save you a lot of headache and, uh, and a lot of frustration and prevent everything from getting to the rodeo. So we got another question in the Q and a box, Joe, any good books or resources on handling and facility layout? No, uh, it's really tough. Uh, it's, it's something that is, it, it's, it's changing a lot right now. Uh, we're right on the edge of really discovering how we should be handling cattle. Um, there's lots of YouTube videos. You gotta be careful with YouTube. There's all sorts of things that are incorrect, but there are some good things out there. Uh, I'll put the names in the chat, uh, or at least Tom's name of the chat in the chat about a name. At least you can look up to kind of start that process of seeing the low stress handling. I think the other piece of it is looking at a bud box. If you look up anything related to bud boxes, if they are set up uh, correctly, that's very different than a bud tub. Bud tub is not sponsored by Bud Williams at all and is not correct. Bud box is. Um, so keep that in mind. Uh, I'll put Tom's name here in real quick. Um, I think for me, the there's not, there really isn't right now. And that's something we're working on at the university to try to get something out there. Uh, cause right now I think there isn't something super available. There are some, uh, if you go to Kansas state, uh, extension, they have some materials, uh, they did a BQA video that had some cattle handling into it. And it was very, very well done with a GoPro and a drone overhead. So you can see how cattle move, uh, in both situations. I really like that. Um, but I'll put Tom's name in that. I'll kind of get you started in the right direction. All right. Great. Um, Sue Von Bank, I see that you have your hand raised. Um, you should have microphone capabilities now if you want to ask a question live. I have to unmute yourself though. Yes. Um, otherwise, I also get that that may have been an accident. So uh, with that, I guess we can kind of start, um, you know, getting... Uh, our wrap up on here. So Joe, do you have any final thoughts or anything, um, you know, that you want to share? I just saw that Susan raised her hand again. So if you are there, Susan, feel free to interrupt, unmute, ask me whatever you need to. Um, no, I, I think, uh, well, actually, yes, of course, my always my final thought whenever we're talking about any of this stuff, uh, build a relationship with your veterinarian. They should be able to help you with a lot of this, especially the design facilities, cattle flow, uh, low stress handling. That is something that uh, almost all veterinarians should have a good handle on. Uh, and so I think that uh, I think that's the place to start. If you if you're wondering where to start, um, con reach out to your local extension educators as well. Uh, if you're in Angie's area or anywhere else in North Dakota, uh, that's a that's a perfect place to start. Reaching out to your local educator, they'll get you in touch with the the right person who has probably has cattle themselves and can, can help you get started with that. Otherwise um, just read as much as you can um, uh, look up Tom Nofsinger, go from there. 
Yeah. Awesome. Um, Angie, any final, final words from you on livestock safety? Yeah, no, I think, uh, Joe, you, you hit the nail on the head when you talked about having that exit strategy. I, I know for our own operation, you know, we're calving in, in our barn for the most part. And so having, we have exactly what you shared as those exit pens. And, and I think doing that prep work ahead of time, it, it is definitely, um, it's definitely prevented some injuries or really bad situations. And so I think that's a really good key message is to um, if, if you're working with cattle like that in a situation where, you know, working with mothers that have a lot going on and, and are experiencing, you know, birth, be ready and, and have that plan in place. Don't, don't do it on the fly because the odds of you getting out of there safely are, are very slim. So I really liked having that exit strategy in place and, and understanding how to work with them and, and move with them. So thank you so much. Yeah, that's a, that's an amazing point. And it goes with any time you're working with cattle. I, I don't care if it's around the shoot. I think We've all been in situations where someone comes out of the chute and they're not super happy and they come back. Well, if you've got six or seven people standing around the chute and uh, you don't have a plan for where everyone's going, uh, there's a lot of uh, tripping over each other and uh, it's just a jumbled mess trying to get everyone safe. So take a couple of seconds, think about it, talk about it out loud, know where you're going uh, and, and have that plan in place. And, and I truly have seen more injuries when you talked about the scissor shoots. I think that's where I've almost seen more injuries occur than, than the actual animal itself because of um, not, not knowing where everyone's at. And like you said, if it's hydraulically run and you don't see somebody, it's, it's right, in the, right in the head. And, and so those can be pretty severe. So I thought that was an excellent uh, point for our audience to, to keep in mind is to also know the equipment you're working with. Yeah, there's a lot, lot going on around the shoot. Uh, there's a lot of communication that needs to happen and it needs to be clear and loud and you cannot be afraid to speak up. Uh, that is uh, the, probably the number one rule around the shoot. If you need a second or you're not where you're supposed to be, you need, you need to speak up uh, and just make sure everyone knows that, uh, that, that you're not in a safe spot. All right, well, I am mindful of.